COVID-19 has changed the world. But despite the challenges we face, the spirit of Africanacity is still alive. It's in the tenacity of the men and women who are still keeping us safe and keeping us going. It's in the creativity you use to find new ways to work, teach, do it all, and stay together, even if you're apart. And it's in the ingenuity of all those who are making a difference. Thank you to everyone still getting things done. Your Africanacity inspires us. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on cash flow management. We are so glad that you could join us this morning. My name is Jane Muya. I'm an investment professional working with the Grasha Marshall Trust. We are the trust are passionate about entrepreneurship, particularly women entrepreneurship. And it is this passion that has led to the partnership that we now have with Absa Bank Kenya PLC. It's our pleasure to partner with the bank to offer SMEs practical tools, solutions, tips, and strategies that they can apply to their businesses to navigate these challenging times that we find ourselves in. It's now my pleasure to welcome Susan Situma, the head of SME banking at Absa Bank Kenya PLC, with opening remarks. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, and hello, everybody, and welcome to today's discussion. Thank you for taking time out and being here with us. I hope you're keeping safe and observing all the preventive guidelines issued by the Ministry of Health. For those who have joined us from our previous webinars, welcome back. We look forward to an interactive session. We are committed to continue playing our role as a leading financial institution in our country, but even more importantly, we remain resolute on helping our customers navigate through this difficult time presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. SME businesses remain very integral uh, to our customer portfolio. We recognize that they are the backbone of our economy and constitute 98% of the businesses in Kenya, employing a total of 14.9 million Kenyans, but unfortunately uh, SMEs are the ones that have been hardest hit by this pandemic. But we are dedicated to continue working with you to ensure that you are able to sustain your businesses despite the prevailing circumstances. We continue to find ways to support you during this period. And some of the measures we have taken include providing payment relief uh, to you during this period. As, as Absa Bank Kenya, we have currently restructured up to Kenya shillings 54 billion worth of loans from 53,000 accounts. These numbers comprise retail and SME facilities, mortgages, commercial and corporate clients facilities. For our business customers, we are still reviewing those that are eligible for the three months repayment relief, which, which is extendable up to 12 months. So if you had earlier taken three months and you need an extension, you can approach your relationship manager or branch manager for the extension. In tandem, we are also extending the credit life cover on the loans for three months at no additional cost. So just to add that if you're a customer and you approach us for the payment relief, you will not incur any extra processing fees as a result of the relief. However, interest will accrue and the loan repayment period will be extended to accommodate the relief. We have also uh, given a variety of, waived a variety of fees across all our digital banking platforms to encourage you as our customers to go cashless. And to this end, we waived the access fee for our internet banking platform, M-Pesa to bank, bank to M-Pesa fees, PESA link transaction fees. And in addition for any deposits up to 100,000 made on our cash deposits taking ATMs, they are also free. So I would ask you to think about using the digital channels as you look for where you can save on your bank charges during this period. These are significant investments we have made on our side as we are foregoing revenue of almost 10 million shillings every month. So not a small amount, but a commitment to make sure that we continue to serve you as our customers. We have gone a step further to make commitments to our SME suppliers. So we are now settling invoices 
within 14 days and additionally working towards paying all invoices of a million shillings and below within seven days. This should go a long way to help these businesses manage their cash flow. We're also investing significantly towards various initiatives like the one that we have today, which is a webinar. So these, these are designed to help entrepreneurs like yourselves and businesses get through this pand pandemic. So in addition to the webinar we have, we'll also have wellness programs, we have mentorship programs, and these have been running very well. But not just that, we've partnered with like-minded partners like the Grassama Shelter Trust, USIU Africa and Strathmore Business School to be able to offer strategic advisory on our overall pro program while sustaining conversations with our SME customers to address any pertinent issues you have that you're grappling with during this time. I will stop here as I would like us to get to the topic of the day, one that you have requested for the most, and I, would be, I will be back at the end of the session to let you know more about the upcoming events. I want to thank our technical experts for this session in advance. We did put a lot of pressure on them to deliver a very practical guide on how you can manage your cash flows during this period. And I have no doubt we shall leave the session more empowered and enabled to drive our businesses forward. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Susan, for those remarks. Um, I wish to go through uh, very quickly some housekeeping rules before we delve into today's topic um, and points worth noting. Our participants will be muted throughout the session. And today's webinar is being recorded. That recording will be shared with yourself. You, uh, feel free to go through it again and share it with your colleagues as well. We will do a, a poll at the beginning, just before we uh, go into the topic. Uh, we also invite your comments and questions. Please refer to your questions tab on your screen and type in your question there. Our speakers will be able to answer them uh, during our question and answer session that will be held at the end. Uh, we also have a quick feedback survey that we will run as you exit. Please take a minute of your time and give us feedback on this session. Now, a great person once said, revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash is king. Well, revenues are nice to have. A revenue generating business uh, is very attractive. When you're making profit, you have that sense of security about you, about your business. But the true measure of business soundness, the true measure of a healthy business really is cash flow. And we have a great opportunity here today to be delving into this topic guided by our expert speakers, whom I will introduce uh, shortly. We'll be able to cover aspects of this uh, topic that include understanding our cash flows, our business cash flows and why they matter, understanding our role as entrepreneurs in managing those cash flows for our businesses. We'll take a look at the cash flow cycle as well as offer practical tips that you can apply to your business to navigate uh, these very challenging times that we are in. Uh, but before I do that, uh, before we go into our topic, um, allow me to run that poll that I've just mentioned. And if we could have that up on our screen. Uh, just take a minute and uh, give us your, your answer on that. We are asking, We are asking what effect has COVID-19 had on your business cash flow? What effect has business has COVID-19 had on your business cash flows? Is it A, where you feel it has uh, made your cash flows decline by over 50%? Or is it the second option there where you, you feel like your cash flows have reduced by about 25% since the pandemic started? Or is it a reduction of less than 25%, your third choice there? Has it had no effect on your cash flows so far? Or is it that you have the unique case where your cash flows have increased during this period, our last option? Um, please give us your answer there. We have about 30 seconds to do that. And we'll be able to share with you the results uh, as they come in. Just about 20 seconds. I hope we are answering that poll question. I encourage each one of us to participate. Oh, 
We are about, uh, about uh, 10 seconds now. And we will close that poll in three, two, and one. Uh, if we could have those results up on the screen, we'll be able to share them with you. Yeah, and 63% of our businesses here today have seen a reduction of over 50% of their cash flow since the pandemic started. We have another 17% that have seen a 25% decline in cash flow. 12% uh, a cash flow decline that is below 25%. 6% fortunately have had no effect uh, uh, in terms of cash flow reduction. But we have a unique 2% that have seen their cash flows increase during this period. And those are our results. Uh, thank you for your participation in that poll. It's now my pleasure to welcome our speakers, our experts today. We have Professor Amos Njuguna. And Amos is a certified public accountant, trainer, and business coach. He holds the rank of a professor at the United States International University, where he also serves as dean in charge of graduate studies, research, and extension. In his line of duty, Amos has worked with small and medium enterprises, helping them to structure their financing options, helping them develop resilient business models and develop and actualize growth plans. Uh, Professor Amos, please say hello to our, our participants. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. And then we have uh, Caroline Wambogo, who is a seasoned accountant, having served in different capacities over the last 17 years in the banking sector. Uh, she holds uh, currently a position as a vice president in the finance department in the role of head of finance decision support at Absa Bank Kenya PLC, dealing with strategy planning, budgeting, forecasting, investor relations, and management reporting. She sits in the board of Absa Bank Insurance Agency as an executive director. She also is the chair of diversity and inclusion at the bank. Welcome, Caroline. Please say hello. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, all. It's our delight to have you in this session this morning. It is now my pleasure to hand over this discussion to our expert speakers who will guide us through today's topic. Welcome, Professor. Welcome, uh, Caroline. And Caroline will kick us off. Thank you once again. Uh, again, it's our delight to take you through this session where we are discussing uh, uh, matters pertaining to cash flow management. And I trust that you can be able to see the screen in front of you because we shall do this by way of presentation. Uh, just to start us off, I think it's uh, very uh, key for us to note that cash is key and is keen. Uh, this is an old age saying, uh, often used to explain the failure of both businesses and I would say also consumer households. For a company to survive, for any SME business to survive, any business for that matter, cash flow is the single most important financial factor. And I think most of you agree with me when I say that because a company could have fantastic revenues, reasonable expenses, significant incomes, but if its financial operations are not designed efficiently, then it could still be having cash flow problems or the way going into negative cash flow. So we want to get into this and fully understand what cash is, uh, why it's the fuel that powers up the engine. When we look at the contents of what we'll be sharing uh, this morning, uh, we want to delve into issues uh, surrounding tips that we could share with you on cash management, understand uh, why the cash flow position matters to you as a businessman, your role on the cash flows, understand the cash flow cycle, and how also to do forecast flows with respect to your cash flow so that you can be able to efficiently run your business. So that is what we'll be covering with us uh, this morning. And I trust this will be ongoing conversations as we engage into the future. We'll be looking at four key concepts uh, that we need us to remember with respect to cash flow management. Uh, the first one being improving your revenue so that you can check your business margins and see how to best account for those accurately. Uh, second one being expense analysis. We want you to be able to leave this session having a very clear understanding why it is important to understand your business costs, categorize your spending, and see how best to efficiently manage your business from a cost perspective. 
The other one is cash flow conversion cycle, the period which takes from you to convert your inventory uh, into cash is a period that is critical for how you flow with your finances in the business. And we shall be getting into a little bit more detail on that for you to understand the whole cycle of cash flow or cash conversion. Lastly, we'll be looking at business forecasting. And you do agree with me that forecasting enables you to sustain your business into the future and to also scale for growth. So as we get into these discussions, our prayer is that you'll be able to get quite a number of insights so that you can apply as many as you could into your business and especially during this season of COVID. 63% of us today have shown that their cash flows have reduced by about 50%. It means that cash flows are affected by so many factors from within and from outside your business. Those we say that uh, in terms of cash flow management, if you are properly organized from inside your business, then you can easily cope with the forces that are external to your business. But if you are not properly organized from inside, when external forces come, they will surely work on you. Today, we just want to focus on cash flows. And so it's important first to say, what are these cash flows? What is not a cash flow? And so what's, what is it that we are in here to do today? Cash flow is cash. The money you can quickly spend, liquidity for that matter. It incorporates the coins, notes, uh, your bank overdraft. Remember, it can be positive or negative. For a bank overdraft, of course, it will be negative the money on your M-Pesa, quick spend, as well as foreign currency and deposits that you can very, very easily transform into cash. Definitely excludes the long-term amounts that you have committed with banks, uh, loans exceeding a year, as well as inventories. So, Today, our focus is on the cash in, cash out. How do we spend? Where do we get our funds? Our business is to say, where am I getting my funds from? How am I spending these funds? And to take us through, I will use a very realistic example of a good friend of mine called Joseph Wafula. Joseph runs a business. He is an importer. He gets electrical appliances and other goods from different countries, uh, depending on consumer demand, brings them here to Nairobi. He stocks them in his Nairobi shop. And who are his customers? About 30% of his customers own other businesses. So we can somehow call him a wholesaler. He also has walk-in customers, guys who just walk in, ask for whatever they need, they buy and go. And there are also other electrical, um, those guys who fix electricity, contractors, they always come to him, give him orders and all that. The question is, what constitutes cash for my friend Joseph? The sales he makes, sometimes he sells on credit and he has to collect that money after some time. Sometimes he imports goods on behalf of his friends and his fellow traders and he charges them a commission. He also makes payment for supplies, sometimes in foreign currency. Uh, he has to transport, he has to pay wages and salaries, he's got to pay taxes, fuel, and many other costs. The question is, what is cash flow management for Joseph? In very, very simple words, it's about ensuring that cash is coming in speedily and conserving the way it goes out. We are not saying don't spend because you have to spend to earn, but he has to maintain that conservative approach to ensure that a bit remains. Of course, the cash in and the cash out don't coincide. So sometimes he will have a bit more, sometimes he will have a bit less, and all of us know how we are a bit down when it goes a bit less and we are short of cash to pay expenses and all that. So today, our discussion 
merely focuses on how can Joseph slow down the payments and receive as much as he can for the maintenance of his business. That's our focus today. Why does it matter? It sustains his business. If you do not have that conservative approach that ensures that something remains, we don't want you to run a business where you get everything and then you pay off everything. It has to be sustainable. If Joseph messes with his cash flows, Kenya Power will not at any time pity him. They will disconnect his electricity. If he doesn't have money for his tokens, that's it. He will be in the dark and the business will close down. If he is always in deficit, if he is always having problems, then you know he will have to keep borrowing, sometimes borrowing very unwisely, sometimes borrowing at extremely high rates, which then takes up even the little cash flow that Joseph has. Ed, so what is our concern, therefore, that we must plan for these cash flows? And I go back to say, to ensure that we are receiving, paying, and maintaining for the business. And critically, if for you to do this, no matter how much my colleagues and myself talk about cash flows, no matter how much your bank supports you, without financial discipline, ladies and gentlemen, you won't go very far. So for Joseph, three things are important. Namely, one, the cash must be positive. Positive means that the money coming in is more than the cash going out. It must be available. When he needs to pay bills, the cash is there. And timely, so that um, Joseph can spend a lot of his time uh, in comfort, knowing very well that he has money to pay all his bills. This therefore requires conscious planning, which my colleague and I will be taking you through. So, in a nutshell, you could be profitable, which is a good thing because it's a long-term measure, but we also want our businesses to have cash. And as Susan has said, SMEs are the backbone of this economy. And I dare say that cash flow management is that backbone because it's what you need to mainstream for you to make that business stand. So we are basically concerned about how we collect, how we disperse, and also how we invest surplus cash. Thank you. All right, so this brings us to our checkpoint number one, back to the four key pointers that we said we would have to look into. So we are saying grow your revenues because then this speaks to the inflow. What is coming into your business? And it's all a question of margins. You know, we say business is actually a margins game, so to speak. So we are saying, can you employ regular checks on how you're sourcing? Because really, if you think about how to increase your margins, it's a factor of your pricing, how you're sourcing your goods vis-a-vis -vis how then you're selling your goods. And this can be done also by performing some competitive bidding so that you have the best price for your sourced goods at the end of the day, because it's either you in, uh, reduce your production or your acquisition costs, or you vary your selling price or increase your volumes. So really that is what will help you secure a higher cash inflow as is depicted in that uh, particular diagram that you can see there on the left, because we want your cash inflow pipe to be larger than your cash outflow pipe. So that what you're able to keep at the end of the day from a business managing perspective is cash that will help you drive your business. The other thing that has just been mentioned is the discipline around invoicing and receipting. How good are you at your record keeping? Because this is the only way you can be able to track how well your business is doing and thereby make any adjustments on the go as you employ these very disciplined record keeping uh, practices. And then keep revisiting your supplier costs. I mean, nothing is cast on stone. Today, you will start as a small scale trader. As you grow and scale your business, you start getting into a place where you can actually source your goods from source. Try and see how you can quickly eliminate all the middlemen to the extent possible.
so that at the end of the day, you have increased your margin and thereby your inflows. What we are basically saying here that the whole idea from a cash flow perspective is to operate at an optimum position so that your cash flow is optimized at the end of the day. So how do we reduce the diameter of that outflow pipe? How do we ensure that that pipe uh, that is giving out the cash is constrained? A few tips. The first thing, you must be in charge. And to be in charge, you must look at what is, these are all my expenses. What, how much of each expense? What is the percentage of each expense? For my friend Joseph, his cost of supplies takes about 40% of his costs. His transport takes about 8%. His rent about 10%. The wages 17% and all that. Why is it important to do this? Because if Joseph has to reduce that pipe, then he must go to the what is draining those things that are really pushing out cash. For example, if Joseph had decided to maybe he offers tea for his workers and the cost of the tea is included in others at 2%, even if he told all his workers no tea from tomorrow, Joseph will not reduce his cost significantly because the T accounts for much less than 2%, assuming that the others is a host of so many other uh, costs. So you would need to do this. And this is where the way you do business counts. Leverage on technology. Technology today is important. It ensures that we are reducing paperwork, it ensures that our advertisement costs are coming down. For example, when you advertise on social media, it's much cheaper. It ensures that uh, even our rent today are being affected strictly by technology. In other words, even this uh, COVID-19 situation, we have had to ask ourselves, did we really need those spaces that we have kept for so long? You also need to look at the timing. When am I supposed to make this payment? It doesn't make sense to do lots of prepayments that is paying for a lot of expenses in advance. Uh, similarly, it doesn't make sense to delay payment so often. So therefore, the timing, you must know when is each expense due and when do you do that. Sometimes it makes sense to transfer costs to other people. Joseph, my friend Joseph, would, would be more comfortable telling people to collect goods from his shop or advising that uh, they said a courier company or Uber or anyone else to go collect the goods or a rider as opposed to them delivering the goods. And then guess what, friends? You need to look at contracts that you sign because contracts have serious implications on cash. Everything you put pen on paper down, it is about either it will resort to you receiving cash or it will resort to you paying cash. Evaluate that contract and say, what is the bottom line? When I do the cash I will receive from the perspective of this contract versus what I will pay, do I make sense signing this contract? And lastly, we have to check on our expenses. Reason being, Today, the consumer's disposable income has gone down. We've seen only 2% of us have recorded increased revenues around this time, which means 98%, it has either remained the same, which means it never grew the way you wanted, or it has come down. The bottom line is customers are not having as much to spend. So it is us to look at our internal operations and drive down the costs. So this brings us to our second checkpoint with respect to expense analysis, as it has been very clearly articulated to us. We definitely need to keep our eye on the costs. We cannot uh, allow our costs, and as many businesses would say, go overboard. Because once your expenses exceed your cash, then clearly you will have a cash flow problem. You'll be getting into the danger territory. So just by way of summary, we are basically saying that Joseph in our case study today has to look for ways to drive efficiency in his business. Think about it. Uh, if you are sourcing goods from 
China. There are quite a number of things that you need to consider. And today we are in a global village. You can incur direct costs through actually traveling to China, or you can actually reduce your direct expenses in the cost of acquisition of your goods by just adopting the digital methodologies that we have today. If you have your good network of contacts with Chinese, all you need to do is download the WeChat app and it will even break the language barrier for you because you, you, you write in English to them, they'll be able to read on their end in Chinese, they'll write to you in Chinese and you'll be able to read on this end in English. So you can be able to communicate very effectively on WeChat. What are we saying? Start employing methodologies in your business that will create efficiencies. This way you'll be able to know, do you need to eliminate some? Do you need to renegotiate others? Do you need to replace uh, some things that you've been doing with systems so that you can create that efficiency in your business and thereby reduce the cost of doing business? Keep separate bank accounts. I would advise you because uh, I know, I mean, at the end of the day, we go into the business to make money, both to grow the business, but also to meet our everyday personal expenses. My advice to us would be, can you please separate your business uh, expenses from your personal expenses? That way you'll be able to even draw a line and get to know how much you actually need on the personal side. And you can draw that from your business through a salary and how much the business is actually consuming. When you're able to do that sort of separation, then you, uh, in your tracking, you can very easily know what needs to be changed on what side so that you can make adjustments on the go. Uh, lastly, consider keeping your costs at 40% lower than your income. This is what most businesses call cost to income ratio. Allow it to come below 40% to the extent possible so that you have got 60% remaining over and above for you to be able to reinvest back into the business, for you to be able to have some investments that you can put aside uh, for the future that is so uncertain as we have seen with COVID. And of course, to be able to grow into other areas and diversify your business even into other income streams. At the end of the day, the amount of cash left over is what grows the business and increases your network. So bear this in mind, even as we continue. Expensive analysis, you cannot run away from it. It's very difficult. So for you to do good analysis, good expense analysis, one of the things that you need to do is to understand exactly how many days does it take for me to change uh, goods into customers, into sales, collect that cash and pay my suppliers. This is what is called the cash flow cycle. For my friend Joseph, it is about the number of days it takes for him to order goods from China, then the goods get to, to Kenya, the number of days it takes to have those goods cleared, the number of days he keeps them, what we call the inventory holding period, uh, all the way to the time he makes the payments, and uh, we'll be talking about that moving on, then delivering of these goods to customers, sending invoices, and ensuring that the customer is paid. Bottom line is, one, you must know how long does that whole cycle take for you. Then once you know how long it takes, think, ask yourself, how can I reduce the number of days that it takes me to move through the whole cycle? So, for you to know and, and, and to work on that, then you need to split your model or your business and the, the way you look at things into three, because there are three main factors that determine that cycle, namely the money that you are collecting from your customers that you sold on credit. That's what we are calling accounts receivable. The payable, how much money are you paying to your suppliers, how much are you paying to the suppliers of goods and services, as well as the inventory. The inventory here is the stock that Joseph gets from wherever and keeps in his shop. How long is he keeping this inventory? You have to monitor the three issues. Add one of the ways of monitoring the three issues, because they cut across, Inventory, that is the stocks, cuts across because you have to pay for it. 
you it goes to the customer so you have to to receive as well and it also itself is a cost so you must ensure that you are not overstocking because if you overstock inventories or stocks have costs of holding one there are costs to do with storage you will need a guard you will need to keep counting the inventory to ensure that it has not been stolen you will have to to ensure the inventory and most importantly if you are not careful the inventory hits the sale by date which means that it becomes obsolete and if it becomes obsolete then no one will buy today technological devices are changing significantly joseph if he buys some of these electrical appliances within no time he will find that they are out of fashion and nobody really wants to buy them i know there is debate about speculation during COVID-19, if I'm holding this inventory, Amos, don't you think I'll be doing much better? Yes, but the question is, at what cost? I would have no problems with stocking inventory. If you have looked at it and said, these are the benefits I will get by keeping this inventory, and these are the costs. Then when I look at the benefits and the costs, I realize that I have a strategic advantage and benefit in keeping this inventory. So uh, it's always good to, to plan your purchases and ensure that you are receiving the inventories on time and delivering them to customers on time. Don't allow them to keep, don't keep the inventory so long for them. Great, and now this brings us to checkpoint number three on cash flow conversion cycle. As it has been very well explained, basically the cycle from the point at which your cash goes out to when the cash comes back in. And so you need to analyze the things that have been explained on inventory and your flow cycle. What about managing your accounts payable and accounts receivables? Embrace alternative methods of payment to make it easier for your customers to pay for the goods. We've got a myriad of choices in this day and age. The pay bill, the m -Pesa to bank, the bank to bank, you can do all these things at your convenience. As a trader, you are encouraged to embrace all these digital options so that that helps to flow in your cash quickly and to make it convenient for your clients. What about checking your payment credit uh, terms, both inwards and outwards? Because you need to be aware of any even diverse trend from a customer perspective when it comes to them making good on their credit uh, sales. So at the end of the day, remember if a sale goes bad, and you have to make a provision for that in your books. It's basically a loss if that money does not come uh, in good time. And if, of course, it doesn't even come at all. So we really have to keep our eye on the time span taken from a cash flow perspective, from when your cash goes out to when your cash comes back in. This is very critical in analyzing even your cash needs as a business. And we'll be seeing that as we get into the forecasting piece. Because really, this is also where you get to have an appreciation of some of the things you can do with your banker in trying to bring about um, the, the, the focusing piece into place. So I think we need to just ensure we are looking into this in a very analytical way so that our cash flows do not get affected. Think about when you buy goods, uh, back to Apula's example of buying goods from China, and they're just and you have to make your payment for those goods to be put on board into the high seas for them to come into Kenya. And that takes about a lead time of about 40 to 45 or even 60 days for them to land here. That is cash that you'd have been otherwise using for other um, needs inside, uh, you know, in, in running your business. So do you need to do a letters of credit with uh, your banker so that you can have those goods secured for them to be transported into the country? Within that period of 40, 45 days, I'm sure as a trader, you'll have turned around your money and served you well by the time you're actually having a cash payout. So let's think about our cash flow conversion cycle. The trick is, the shorter it is, the better as you run your business. My friend Joseph has a maximum period which he has set for his customers. He has also introduced a way of giving cash discounts. Those guys who pay him money, he can give them 2%, 5%, and he keeps reviewing who his customers is. What that has done 
is that it has enabled him to somehow have some kind of timing of the cash flow. He, it has enabled him to be saying, in 30 days, I will be getting money from my customer X. In 45 days, I will be expected to send money to China. Around this time, I will be expected to, to, to pay for my electricity. Around this time, I have to pay for my wages and salaries. Ladies and gentlemen, that is typically projecting. This guy simply sits and decides that this is when I will do it. And what does he then do? He creates a very simple map that says this is July, August, September. This is the money I expect to receive. This is the money I expect to pay. This is the difference in cash that I expect to have. And then he also looks at the balances that he currently has. So in short, because he has a simple Excel program, it, he simply projects it on his screen and calls it a cash flow dashboard, just like the way you look at the dashboard of your car. He simply puts it that way. And he's able to tell when he will require to visit his bank for a facility. He's able to tell when he's likely to have excess cash. And then he will have to follow up because making the projection is good, but following up to ensure that that cash is being received and the payments are being made in the right way is also critical and important. So he starts by looking at his sales, the income, the money that is really coming in. So he says, these are the stocks I have. Again, he knows that 60% of his customers are fellow traders. 30% of the customers will walk in, walk out. So it will, it's not easy. He can't tell who will walk into his shop tomorrow to buy. He can't tell that. Uh, and then he also knows that 10% of the customers are contractors. And some of these contractors may not pay sooner because the contractor is working on a county government project and sometimes the cash flows from the county government is delayed. And so he will have to make an estimate. So his estimates will be based on what? He will have to say, look, this is what I can receive from the walk-in walkouts. It's always good to look at history and comparisons. He can, for example, say uh, last year between January and April, this is what we received uh, because he kept good records as my colleague Caroline was saying. Uh, so he will be able to tell that this is what I can expect around this time. He will then record the payments. The good thing in recording is that the payments are more certain. You know when the landlord will come, you know when to pay for electricity, you know when to pay for wages and salaries, you know all those things. Uh, but that's the good thing in terms of recording. The bad thing, because you will have to have money to make those commitments. Then Joseph will calculate the difference of what he expects to receive minus what he expects to pay. And then he will add the balances of cash that he had at the beginning. Remember, we defined cash as the real cash coins and notes that we have, the balances in M-Pesa, the bank balances, the bank overdraft, if it is negative, he will record it as a negative, and then he will sum up to see what he is likely to have at the end of that month or at the end of that quarter. So the most difficult to project is sales because again many customers will want let me come i will pick it up when i have the money uh, we have seen that 60 percent of these guys uh, will be fellow traders uh, we have seen 30 percent of these guys are uh, working customers who are very difficult to predict and then the 10 percent so what what we advise and what joseph would do in this case is to set an optimistic limit that is the very best that if all goes well this is what my sales for this month will be and i know we do that deep inside our minds put it in writing now look at the pessimistic pessimistic is what is the worst that can be by looking at the pessimistic and the optimistic we bring in the external factors such as now we have covid so you have to go back and ask ourselves 
how has COVID-19 affected my specific business as a supplier of electrical goods? How has it affected the supplies? How has it affected the customers? How has it affected my employees? How has it affected the delivery channels that I have? In that case, then you are saying, this is the best it can be, and this is the worst it can be. Then you come in and say, hold on, I'm not likely to be the best, neither am I likely to be the worst, so can I do a most likely estimate? Usually we advise a most likely estimate can be a half. You can say the most optimistic, maybe Joseph projects this month he will make total sales of 200,000 plus the worst it can be is 50,000. So he adds 200,000 plus 50,000. That is 250,000. He divides that by two and gets 125,000. He can plan with that and say that that is the most likely scenario. Another way of looking at it is to look at there are those goods that are very fast moving. Those ones you can give them a higher rating in terms of optimism. And there are those that are slow moving, you can give them a lower rate in terms of being pessimistic. Moving on, he must also forecast the cash payments. As I said, the cash payments are much easier. Begin with the con contractual committed costs. Committed costs and contractual costs will be in that contract. There is that bank loan that you need to pay, the principal plus interest. There is that uh, uh, rent that you need to pay, wages and salaries that you need to pay. Those ones are already committed. Begin with those ones, they are very certain. Then come and project those that are not certain. Put them there. Step one, there are those that are contractual, work on them, review, look at your checkbook, see if there are payments that you are supposed to make which you have not made or that you promised to make at a certain point in time. And uh, also add a cushion. It's always good not to plan for expenses. Just like when you go for a trip and you know that uh, you will require about 3,000 shillings. You don't carry exactly 3,000. Chances are that you carry 3,000 plus something to take care of any eventuality that may arise. And the unfortunate thing is that uh, for sales, no one is likely to give you an additional amount and tell you, I'm so happy I've been buying from you, so I want to buy more and more. But for expenses, they, they are likely to arise contingencies. You're likely to go to a supplier who tells you, I'm sorry, I had not included the transport costs and you have bought the goods. So you've got to bear those costs. Uh, lastly, what are we saying? Do not keep so much money. Don't keep so much. Similarly, don't keep too little. Not too much, not too little. Just a cash balance that is enough to meet your day-to-day -day expenses. Because if you have too little, then you will have, you'll be stressed over paying bills. If you have too much, then you are losing because that money should be in the bank earning interest. It should be in a treasury bill, giving you some kind of investment returns. So for you now to determine how much it is at the end of the period that you are planning for, it could be a month, it could be a week, it could be a quarter, depending on how you do your business. Um, Take the balance at the beginning, add the total cash you expect to receive. And what I need to add here is that uh, in addition to sales, you could have other incomes that you are receiving. For example, rent. We have seen Joseph imports on behalf of his other friends. And so what does he do? He charges them a commission. That commission is a receipt to him. Add everything you expect to receive. Maybe you have put in a bit of money in a fixed deposit account with APSA or uh, with anyone else, that deposit has generated an interest. That interest is also a part of your money. Add it there, then deduct the cash payments. Remember to plan, timing, timing is critical. Remember to say, this is what I'm supposed to pay in July, this is what I'm supposed to pay in August, and this is what I'm supposed to pay in September. Plan accordingly. 
then the resultant balance. So we have seen it will be the cash you receive minus the cash you pay plus what you had at the beginning to give you the balance as you had. With that very articulate process as to how you actually uh, put in place a cash flow dashboard in your business brings us to checkpoint number four about this forecasting um, exercise that you must do for your business so that you can be able to predict the amount of cash that you expect to come in and go at certain periods of time. This helps you to set aside cash even for emergencies and map up uh, map out expenses. We actually say you should be able to have uh, cash that can fit your six months expenses, not necessarily in cash form, even if you were to invest the money, just ensure that it is in liquid items, items that you can quickly turn back into cash within a short period of time. That's what we call liquid items, so that you can cushion your business from unforeseen shocks. And I think COVID and going by the response uh, from the poll earlier, has definitely taught us a few lessons around this piece on how quickly your cash can run out in an event of an eventuality. So we really need to ensure that we are able to have something set aside for emergencies and forecasting is one of the surest way to help you achieve this. When you look also at uh, forecasting from a seasonality perspective, it helps you to project back to the scenarios you've been talk talk talked about about being pessimistic or having a most likely scenario, or even uh, the third scenario there that was discussed. We are talking about the seasonality of the business. You know, how prone is your business to some of these seasons? And seasons come and go, but the thing is, are you well prepared for them? Are you able to tell at what point in time in your business you need to inject some additional capital? Are you able to tell at what point in time in your business are you able to even order for those goods? So basically what we are saying, forecasting helps your business to grow. Forecasting ensures the sustainability of your business. If you ask us, this is the most critical aspect of cash flow management because everything else then draws from the plans that you have in place. Looking at the diagram there, even uh, as we go along, the thing is, how quickly are you able to project your future sales? vis-a-vis -vis your future expenses. If you look at what businesses have done to respond to COVID in this season, some of them were quickly able to know which costs to pull out. Mm -hmm. Others were quickly able to know which financial partners to speak to and to speak to in good time. You've heard about some of the solutions with respect to extending your loan repayments or even giving you a repayment holiday on the lendings that you have from banks. And those are some of the things and the insights that come from forecasting. So keep this at the, as a top priority for your business if you're going to manage your cash flow. Remember, cash is king and cash is key. Very good. So then, I hope the pipe is becoming smaller. By now, I mean, a lot of things going around your mind. I need now to start making this pipe smaller. Let's give you a few tips. First, think about if you are equipment heavy, you are using lots of equipment, you are using lots of vehicles, would it be easier to lease and pay, say, on a quarterly or monthly basis, or to simply buy the assets? Of course, there are advantages of buying over leasing. There are also advantages of leasing over buying, and that is a critical decision you would want to take. So with a very thorough consideration, because leasing spreads your cash flows. Buying ensures that you are buying at once and you may run short of working capital. And connected to that, it, today's world, we've learned that I do not need to own a whole truck to be able to deliver goods from Nairobi to Mombasa. We've learned that. We've learned there are people who are in business simply to transport, and you simply need to sign contracts with them, ensure that you have taken your precautions so that goods will be delivered to your client on time, and that's it. Consider keeping off unnecessary capital costs. Consider negotiating payments. Uh, my colleague Carol has articulated it very well. 
when you do your forecasting, you are able to tell, hold on, there is no way I'm going to pay this loan in July. So as early as May or June, you have already approached the banker. Uh, consider looking at uh, equipment. The equipment sometimes in today's world, again, does not need to be the brand, 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 brand new. It is, is the equipment fit for purpose. Sometimes as SMEs, and I've worked with some, a number of SMEs that I can tell you, there is a question I like asking, why did you buy this? Oh, and, and many SMEs will say, it was good to have. It was good to be in my office. This is the latest technology. Then I go ahead and ask, by changing it, how much more did your sales increase? And they say, mm, I haven't calculated, but I really don't think my sales increased too much. So the, the, the question here is, do I really need this? Do I really need to go for it? Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing uh, is about your business model. I always advise that during periods when, during periods when there, there is constrained sales like now during the COVID-19, ensure that you have fewer committed costs and more of variable costs. So your committed or fixed costs are much lower. Your variable costs, those that move with your sales, are represent a greater percentage of your costs. Mm -hmm. What that does is that you are able to meet costs from the sales that you generate from those costs. In, in simpler words, issues like increasing the number of employees when you need them, reducing when you don't need them. And that takes us back, what kind of contract did you sign? How did you engage them? Was it very clear? Because your contract should then be based on the way you design your contract should be based on the way you run your business, as well as the seasonality, meaning the time at which you are checking on it. The other aspect, and this is where many of us go wrong, as we grow and we are happy growing, we fail to grow our systems in tandem. So you find that you've got two branches here, you've added another branch, so now you have three, then you forget that supervising three businesses or three branches is not the same as supervising one branch. So you start, you, you find that things that uh, you are in total control of, uh, you are no longer in control of them. Create systems, leverage on technology. Today, with today's technology, I could simply sit on my phone and I can tell the numbers in my counter in Kisumu and yet I'm in Nairobi. I can tell the stocks, the inventories, how they are moving while I'm still here. I could order and all that. So you've got to have a security system that gives you checks and balances, that gives you assurances that this is where I am today, this is where I'm likely to be tomorrow, and that kind of, that kind of thing. The other thing is, and I keep saying this, please ask yourself, do I really need this? Do I really need this? What would happen if I eliminated the whole of this thing that I do? What would happen if I stopped, for example, delivering goods to customers and asking them to be coming for them? Maybe you will lose, so that is an important activity. Maybe you will gain, then that is a non-value added activity. How does it serve me to send printed invoices? Could it be better to simply PDF and put it on WhatsApp and the customer gets it wherever he is? Could it be better? You have slowed down costs, you have used fewer workers because you will need a worker who will travel all over to come, sign papers and all that. Are you able to do a lot of these things virtually and get things going? The other thing here is ensure that you are on top of things as the SME owner especially. Mm -hmm. You must be able to analyze and say what is happening to the overall economy. Listen to politics, listen to advancements in technology, listen to what economists are saying, listen to your own industry. If you are in the daily industry, read through what is the Kenya board saying, daily board saying about how this milk industry will be in the near future and start aligning your business plan 
and you are focused as well to that important aspect. You have to listen, use information to make decisions. Your decisions should not be driven by your inner and gut feeling. At least as I'm feeling like we would know. Look at the data. What is driving you? What is making you make the decision you are making today? In case of surplus cash, and we pray for that, invest it. So, in conclusion, what are we saying? Let us manage our costs. Look at every opportunity to manage the cost. And I have said that there are two issues here. One, conduct a percentage analysis. What is the percentage of this cost? What is the percentage of this cost? What is the percentage? Conduct a, 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 a percentage analysis. Then the second thing that you need to do, manage your patterns. Avoid overtrading. Also avoid other trading. Other trading simply means that you have capacity to do more, but you are doing less. But also avoid over trading. That your capacity is not as much, but you are all over. You are you can't be everywhere. You need to be somewhere. If you do have excess cash, it's always advised you can always repay your debts to ensure that you are slowing leverage to be able to uh, to attract cash flows for the future. Encourage, ensure that you are collecting money from the people who sell to you on credit. Talk to your bank in advance if you need support and forecasting is what should guide the conversation between you and the bank forecasting and your business plan projections will guide you on what you need to tell your banker so as we come to a close i think you have picked quite a number of practical tips from my colleague there professor amos on how you can manage your cash flows and it's not lost on us to note the fact that you definitely do need uh, help once in a while from a business management perspective. So we know that the business cannot necessarily fully generate all its cash flows that it requires to run not just their daily expenses, but also their future expenses and also scale for growth as a business. So we do have an appreciation of the fact that from time to time, you will definitely do need a capital injection of one nature or another. So we are encouraging us not to fail also to pick up such opportunities because you can borrow. You can also seek if you have a shareholding sort of structure for your business, you can have your shareholders also put in more money. But at the end of the day, in as much as you borrow or get all these um, other avenues for which you can raise more monies, you must still as a business be able to generate a better return for this invested cash into this business. So there are definitely acceptable methods in which in the short term, you can deal with liquidity issues in the company or in your business. What we are basically saying, let that not be the norm. At the end of the day, let the business be able to thrive on its own. So whilst you will get supported along the side, I think I have people who say, use other people's money, which is okay, but see and ensure that your business is actually sustainable. So one of the things for us, and especially from a banking perspective as financial solutions, uh, is that we definitely do have working capital um, solutions that we can give to you, trade facilities. We've talked about local purchase orders, what we know as LPOs financing, so that we can discount that for you, the invoice discounting as well. Uh, we can give you short-term loans. We have encouraged us to use the digital channels that are available to you. There are lots of financial solutions that we can definitely uh, take on board to manage your cash flows and of course run your business in a more efficient way. Of course, we'll talk a, lot, a little bit more about our offering as we continue to engage even during other sessions, the mentoring session that will be happening at a later time that will be advised to us. In conclusion, what are we saying? We are saying that you need to run your company profitably but cash must be given a unique focus you as the business leader as the ceo of your sme business it doesn't matter the size of your business cash must be given its immediate focus so that you can be able to run that business in a sustainable manner 
because without cash, the business will eventually fail. And there are many examples uh, you can get, even in our very own country, where we've seen big companies go to their knees because of, of a cash flow crunch. We would not want that to happen to you. And so we want to leave you with the quote from Jack Welch. Uh, Jack Welch uh, was a CEO of, of, of G Electric, uh, you know, General Electric, for, but for 20 years thereabouts. And this is what he said, that if he had to run a company on three measures, those measures would be customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and cash flow. He understood the importance of cash flow. We need to embrace its importance and employ it to our businesses. So I want to hand over the program back to our moderator, Jane, to guide us into the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, our dear speakers. Um, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Caroline, for that wonderful unpacking of today's topic. And we have so many questions coming in thick and fast, and we will be able to just handle them uh, as we go along through this Q&A session. Um, I'll just be able to uh, assign those uh, as I'm looking at them. Uh, the first one there is one that I would want us to tackle because it's come from three different people. And Professor, our participants are asking you to clarify what is zero-based budgeting. What is uh, the switch to zero-based budgeting? And and for you, Carol, um, somebody is saying banks usually have a reserve ratio. Uh, is it possible that uh, there's probably something like a reserve ratio for the industries? Uh, is it possible to have a number there that uh, people can use to to just determine how much uh, cash they need to put in reserve? We could go with those ones for now, and then we'll pick others. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, and, and sorry for the oversight. I didn't mention zero-based budgeting, but I talked about it. Zero-based budgeting is a concept of thinking where you ask yourself, do I really, really, really need this? Hence the word zero-based. So before I spend or before I make my plan for spending, I'm asking myself, do I really need to pay rent? Oh, yeah, because if I don't pay, I'll be chased away. So that is important. It must get into my list. Um, do I need to hang out with friends for um, some dinner outside there or a cup of coffee? Mm, maybe not very important. So it's non-value added, so I don't include it. So zero-based budgeting is about questioning the value add of everything that you are putting your money on. Yeah, and, and thanks for the question on the reserve ratio uh, for banks. I think in terms of uh, the context of cash flow, the one ratio that I would uh, recommend is what banks call the liquidity ratio. Uh, that's a regulatory ratio that has been sent by, uh, set by the Central Bank of Kenya, being the regulator of banks, and it's been set at 20%. But let's just break it down a bit so that we can see how relevant it is to your business. So this is the ratio uh, that determines how much of our assets have been held in liquid assets, meaning that they can quickly be turned into cash in the event that we need to, uh, you know, to, 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 to meet our current obligations, so to speak. So in your business, analyze your current assets because that is where your cash sits and other liquid and, and the non-liquid items uh, from an assets perspective. Analyze your current assets and see whether you can get to an average ratio. I would say for SMEs, I would work with 30% so that you can have 30% of your current assets being held in liquid uh, form in such a way that you can quickly convert those assets into cash. When we say liquid and non-liquid, what exactly do we mean? If you have property, for example, you've invested in, say, the real estate, you know very well to sell any piece of property, not just in this country, but I think it's also uh, you know, across the nations, it takes a long time. So you need the cash now yet you have this property that you're holding that will take a bit of time to convert it into cash. So that is a non-liquid asset. So the liquid assets that I'm making reference to here will be the cash in bank, whether sitting in a current or a savings account or sitting in a fixed deposit because you can easily liquid liquidate your fixed deposit. At the same time, treasury bills, treasury bonds, uh, if you're able to invest in those platforms as well, then those would be also considered to be liquid assets. So try and make it at 30% uh, so that you can have a good reserve 
so to speak, with respect to cushioning your business in the event of a shock. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Professor. Um, just to mention so many messages coming through, people saying this has been a very uh, useful uh, session. Guys are happy that they were part of it. Uh, then we have somebody who is asking, um, is it different for the service industry, what you've spoken about? And as we marry that with somebody else who's saying, what about if you're dealing with perishables? Is, is that different? Does cash flow management become different for those? Um, I think, uh, Professor, you can take uh, the one for the service industry, Carol, uh, the issue of the perishables. Uh, thank you for that question. Is it different for services? The principles are exactly the same. The only difference is the operating cycle because for the operating cycle, uh, the operating cycle for the services might be shorter uh, compared to the one of the guy who is importing goods and all that, but not always also shorter because assume you are offering consultancy services. A consultant service can take like even a whole month or something like that. So the principles are the same. All you need to do is to contextualize. Whether you do a lot, uh, you do laundry, whether you run a supermarket, whether you are in manufacturing, these principles are universal. It is about customizing and putting them together. The way you design your contracts, the way you manage your costs, the way you use technology, the only difference is how am I applying technology in my own case? Thank you. Yeah, and, and maybe just to tie it in with a question on the perishable items. Mm -hmm. Again, the principles do not change uh, uh, regardless of the commodities that you deal with. And in my view, especially for those dealing with perishable items, you may want to employ a lot of the tips that have been shared with respect to inventory management, because remember that item perishable as it were is your inventory. Uh, apply the inventory tips with respect to how much you can stock within a given period of time. Because remember, at the end of the day, you also want to sell fresh uh, perishable uh, goods uh, at the end of the day to your customer. But at the same time, also think about your sourcing. So in terms of cutting costs, the middlemen that we were talking about, you know, can you try and ensure that you source at source, so to speak, so that you have a bigger, wider margin for you to grow the business. Because remember, regardless of your type of business, but based on the commodities that you buy and sell, at the end of the day, you're in business to make money. So the principles on cutting down costs, increasing your margins, managing your inventory, your cash conversion cycle still apply regardless of the product and commodities that you deal with. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, someone is asking on the issue of, uh, and Professor, you'll take this one, on the issue of accounts receivable, how do you handle tax obligations that you're, uh, you're expected to pay, yet you have not been paid by the customer? A good example is VAT, which falls due every month. How do you handle that? And for Carol, uh, somebody is seeking to find out, David is seeking to find out, do you have wealth management solutions for investing excess, in, excess cash? Thank you. I might go first. Yes. Uh, with regard to accounts receivable, how do you handle? Uh, I just want to ensure that I understood the question correctly. How do I handle accounts receivable? Because I'm supposed to pay VAT. We know that VAT payable is determined at the point of sale, possibly at the even at the point of invoicing and, and that kind of thing. That's the point at which you determine uh, the, the VAT. And I'm assuming what you are saying here is that by the time you are supposed to make the payment by 20th of, uh, of uh, the next month or something like that, uh, by that time, the customer has not paid you. Unfortunately, that should be part of your planning because the moment you say that uh, my customer duration, how long am I allowing my customers to pay? Remember I said, my friend Joseph has a, uh, the time he allows his customers. He says, you have to pay within 30 days. So by the time he's paying, he's planning that this is the point at which I receive the money and this is the point at which I make the payment. However, depending on industry, it may not be practical because you might allow a longer duration and government wants you to pay for the money sooner. In that case, you must finance your business by ensuring that you have cash 
to be able to meet those expenses as we fall due. Thank you. Yeah, so to the question by David on wealth management solution, yes, we do have wealth management solutions as APSA Bank. So you can uh, definitely get in touch with us to have an appreciation of what is uh, you know, on offer in that sense, based of course uh, on your plan, because remember at the end of the day, uh, any wealth management solution is, is crafted to fit your unique uh, personal wealth plan. So that is a conversation we can definitely take forward. Uh, just, you just need to get in touch with us. But maybe for the sake of the bigger audience, uh, there are quite a number of solutions um, you know, that we offer. So there's not just the banking, and of course there's the lending piece that helps with your, your business by getting uh, you know, lending assistance from us. But remember, we have investing solutions to help you grow your wealth. So the surplus funds that you make are monies that you can invest into mutual funds, you can invest into money market funds. And that is something that as a bank, we can help you through our asset management uh, department that deals with that. So it's a conversation we'll definitely uh, be looking forward to have with you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Professor um, Jacob is asking, does the business type selected by Joseph, who is your case study, have an implication on the cash flow management? Are there best strategies for business selection in this case? Uh, in terms of, we selected uh, the case of Joseph to serve as a flowing example. Uh, and how would, would I then be able to select? I could, we could have selected any other, but uh, the point is that we are able to, to, to provide a discussion on it. The bottom line is that cash flow management really does not, the, the, the principles as we had just said are the same they don't change regardless of the business. But you must also be able to evaluate and contextualize, because I think the point here is about contextualization. Let me go for a person who is, for example, in the dairy industry, um, dealing with perishables and all that. The, the point is they must look at it and say, what does inventory mean for me? Inventory means fresh milk. Fresh milk, can, will go bad in a few hours. So what do I need to do? I need possibly to add value, convert the fresh milk to yogurt, which has a relatively longer shelf life. Mm -hmm. So the, the bottom line is that it's about contextualization. And, and that's why we do have so many different programs that, uh, that take us through this. We can't do a contextualization exercise in uh, about one and a half hours that we have. And, and that's why we do have quite a number of programs that we 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 use, uh, we go through. We run a mentoring program. We also run a program in, uh, together with ABSA uh, as USIE. Together with ABSA is a whole nine months period where we work with regard to your business. So I, I think that's the way I would put it, Jane. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That, that makes it clear. And uh, Kabiru is asking, is there a software in the market that I can use to monitor, update, and track the flow of cash for my business? Uh, Prof, do you have any suggestions for a cash management software that is in the market? Yeah, thank you. I do not want to market for anyone, <laughs> <laughs> unless if we do have that kind of arrangement. But uh, what I would advise is, yes, software for cash management are available. And there are two ways that you can acquire software. One, you can buy what is called off the shelf. Off the shelf, you literally walk to the mm -hmm. shop. They are simple software to use for SMEs like QuickBooks, Tani, mm -hmm. um, Pastel. Um, there they, they are quite a number of, those ones are easy to use. But then you can also have, nowadays we have so many young people and um, who help in designing software, okay? It, um, and what they do is uh, you, you get someone, you tell them that this is what I want. That is what we call custom made. The beauty with the custom made is that it fits your specific purpose. The, if you go for off the shelf software, uh, the one that is ready to use, be prepared that it is much wider in scope and it may not fit exactly what you want. I always compare that to when you go to the shop to buy a suit, a shirt, or a jacket. 
the thing is, if you buy one that is ready-made, it might fit you, but it might have problems here and there. But if you go to the tailor and you say, take my measurements and really take uh, and make a jacket or a suit for me, then you go and get one that exactly fits you. So it's a trade-off and it's a conversation we can continue. Okay, so you, you, you could be free to reach uh, to us, we can help with that. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, um, our our experts. Thank you for our participants who have uh, taken their time to ask questions. I uh, thank you for your participation in this webinar so far. Um, just some key takeaways from what I've listened and learned: that we are not saying don't spend money. It's really about cash conservation. Uh, cash flow should have three key characteristics, which are: it should be positive it should be available, it should be timely. And the amount of cash left over is what grows your business. It's not about how much you spend or how much you get in. It's what remains at the end of the day that will grow your business. And then of course, have a cash flow dashboard. And I'll leave you with a quote uh, from Sir Richard Branson, who said, never take your eye off the cash flow because it is the lifeblood of business. It is now my uh, pleasure to welcome Susan Situma, the head of SME banking at Absa Kenya Bank PLC, once again with closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline and Professor Jinguna. I mean, very enriching, very engaging, very practical, relatable session that we've had on cash flow. Indeed, cash is key and is king for any business, and we need to think of ways to conserve our cash during this period. Thank you, Jane from Grasa Marshall Trust for moderating the session for us. What next? Our July month is really packed for you, but first things first, we have a mentorship session on this cash flow webinar. And I've had the questions that uh, our audience has asked around, uh, how do you customize it to my business? The, you want to then come on to this session. It will be held on the 30th of June, which is next week, Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon, and it will the, the expert will be able to go deeper into what you're having in your business and try and give you some tips that are very specific to your business. So do, do register for that session. You can send us an email through the Business Club email address uh, that was on the flyer that, for, that was used for registering for this session. And with that flyer, we can be able to send you the logging details for the mentorship session. So. Next, for those participants that missed the session on taking your business online that we held in May, this was one of our first sessions. Uh, we have another session slated for this Thursday uh, that, that will cover all our Africa region business as Absa Bank Group. And uh, it will be held on this Thursday, 25th of June, 11 a.m. to 12 noon. And it will focus on learning how to optimize your business, and connect online with your customers for new growth opportunities. The session will be led by Manish Sardana. He's a managing director for Squad Digital, and he also has built the Gopi e-commerce platform, which I'm sure some of you would already be familiar with as, as uh, SMEs for selling your goods online. So we shall share the invite and you can register for the same uh, later today. Our next webinar will be on the 7th of July, we shall advise the timings. And for this one, we are targeting the women entrepreneur uh, who is doing it all during this period. I mean, juggling work, home, schooling, or just um, uh, having children at home and you're probably homeschooling them. Possibly you're still cooking for your family as well as looking for the next contract to get your business to survive. So the topic will be work-life balance and we have a very ex exciting panel lined up for this session so if you're a woman entrepreneur in this session you definitely want to look out for that and see how to register then we shall have a peer networking session on the 10th of july at around 6 p.m it's a networking session remember it will be hosted by a dj and we shall be introducing to you the new ways of networking during this period so we do realize that the pandemic has definitely changed our way of interaction and we are not able to physically meet and exchange our business cards or even do a pitch for your business. So this session will help you to even do a pitch during the, the, the network, the peer networking session. So we shall also send out details for that. 
And then the last webinar for July uh, will be on the 21st of July, which will be covering the topic on innovation. And you don't want to miss this session as well, because as you think of how to reposition and reinvent your business, you definitely want to get uh, into some of the ideas of some of the people who are really in this creative industry and looking to think of how, how can you position your business to get the most out of the opportunities out there. So uh, thank you for keeping it with us. Do remember to participate in our exit survey just before as you leave this session. It's been a real pleasure having you. I just want to say that what I have realized during this pandemic is that it's really important to keep going, even if not in the way we are used to. Every step forward is progress, and we are here to support you navigate the how. So we pray that you continue to keep safe. Until next time, uh, bye and God bless. Thank you. Oh, so we can breathe We're now. We're done. <laughs> We're done.